I'm Nan McKay, and I would like to introduce you today to Norm McLaughlin. Norm is founder of McLaughlin and Associates, and he is a seasoned executive with 30 years of leadership experience in public administration, economic policy development, and all aspects of affordable housing. He's a nationally recognized innovator in use, utilizing tax exempt bonds, federal, state, and local funds, and tax credits to complete award winning projects in urban and in rural environments. Norm was executive director of the Kitsap County Consolidated Housing Authority for many years, where he preserved and developed over 1,000 apartments for low and moderate income families throughout Kitsap County. During his tenure there, he increased the authority's assets. Are you ready for this? From less than 10 million to over 200 million due to multi-use project development and diversification of the revenue base. He's demonstrated his leadership abilities as president of the National Association of Local Housing Finance Agencies, where he participated in successful efforts to maintain funding for housing and economic development programs. He also has advocated on a national level as a member of the National Rural Housing Coalition in efforts that increased funding for the self-help homeownership program and reform of the multifamily preservation rules. So welcome, Norm McLaughlin. Well, thank you, Nan. It's really an honor to be here. I've you know, watched several of your previous you know, uh, podcasts, and uh, I've known Kent Watkins since we were on the Affordable Housing Advisory Board uh, that uh, Chuck Edson put together. And so I've seen you know, these champions, and I'm just honored to be here. Well, you're a fellow, so you are honored yourself because you're a fellow in the American Academy of Housing and Communities. And that means that you've been recognized for your achievements in housing and community development. So tell us a little more about what you did and what was your role in this general arena? Well, I'm basically a houser, a practitioner. And I started a long time ago in Chapel Hill, North Carolina as a single family home builder. And I got involved with a bunch of Duke and UNC professors and I started a small uh, development for them next to Duke Forest. And it turned out that there was no way that we could do an environmentally sensitive development without changing the rules. And so I got some UNC students and we were able to pass the first plan unit development ordinance in Orange County and we built out the development. And it sort of led me into the idea of being in urban planning, urban studies. And uh, we then in like 72 and 73 had something called disintermediation. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's when interest rates are higher in one part of the country and lower in another. And before we had national markets. And so the money would flow to California and all the savings and loans in North Carolina would send their money there. And half of the home builders in the Chapel Hill, Raleigh, Durham era went out of business. And so with that, I decided maybe it was time to move across the country. And I moved to Washington State and I stayed with a friend of mine, Roy Schindelheim, who became the head of the state office on aging. And while I was there uh, with him as a volunteer, I wrote the housing section of 1316, which is the Senior Citizen Services Act, still one of the only laws in the country that's ratified the Older Americans Act. And after the bill passed, I was hired by Pierce County to carry out that act and to build some senior housing in Gig Harbor. But before I actually completed building the housing, I found out that the Tacoma Housing Authority had all of the control of the Kitsap, of the Pierce County Housing Authority in which you know, Tacoma is located. And so none of the people in, in Pierce in the rural areas were being served. And so I was able to split out the Pierce County Housing Authority from the Tacoma Housing Authority. And then rental assistance and other grants and things flowed to the rest of the county. And that was a great thing. 
And after that, I, I uh, took a little hiatus and I, I went to work for the Community Services Administration. I worked for Dwight Inc., who was on one of your previous you know, podcasts. And he was a great guy. And I was there when the agency closed, which was really an amazing experience. And, and so uh, right after that, the Kitsap County came to me and said, well, Bremerton has control of our housing authority and there's nothing happening in the county. It all happens in Bremerton. So I was able to split off the Bremerton housing, the Kitsap assets from the Bremerton Housing Authority, and we created the first consolidated housing authority in the state of Washington and maybe in the country. It was, uh, uh, we had three county commissioners and three of the city's mayors on the board. So they were all elected officials and it was a new thing, but we had the Trident submarine base and we had tremendous military development that caused the vacancy rates to be like 2%. And so they really wanted more family housing. And so that was one of the you know, things that I started doing was developing family housing for them. And I must say, we, we didn't have many resources back then in the 80s. And so I uh, ha had to really scrounge around and we figured out that the city of Bremerton had a block grant program, but the county didn't, the county was too small. So I went to our Congressman Norm Dix and then we went to uh, Henry Gonzalez and said, we're so heavily militarily impacted, we need to do something about this. And they made us uh, an entitlement community with a special provision in the law. And we were, after that, able to get about $2 million in block grant and 800000 in home money every year after that. And that really helped us get a lot of our development going. Wow. So I just thought I'd mention some of the policy things that came up. Well, you've been a champion of economic development for most of your life. And interestingly enough, in both the urban and rural setting. So why has this endeavor kind of been your focus? Well, it just came about by chance that, you know, in Kitsap, a heavily militarily, you know, uh, job employment situation, they didn't have the kind of businesses that they have in Seattle and the other communities. And so they look for leadership in the housing authority. I was one of the larger developers in the county, and it, it was an honor to do it. We uh, actually didn't have to change any laws there, but we wrote all the economic development plans for the county and the three cities, creating incentives. And we did a survey and found out that there, there really wasn't enough places to do business. And so we were able to have over 3,000 acres zoned, rezoned for business enterprises. And that's really, really helped. So it was just a natural transition for me. Well, you've utilized tax exempt bonds, which a lot of people have not, and of course, tax credits to produce affordable housing. So talk about why these avenues have been so important to housing development. Well, as the director of a housing authority in Washington state, we're also considered a housing finance agency. So we have the ability to sell securities, tax exempt bonds and raise funding that way. But it was so wonderful because there were no standards for development like there were under HUD. I built some of the last public housing built in the country and it was, as they say, do as uh, HUD says do, you know, do as you're, you know, do as you're told. And they wouldn't let us build garages and the places were modest. And yet, and the families were stigmatized. When the kids would get off the bus, all the other kids would know these were the low income kids. And so with tax exempt bonds, you could build things that were much better designed that fit the neighborhood, that no one knew the people who lived there were low income. And in our state, and all states have different uh, rules, you only had to have 51% of the occupants below 80% of the median income whereas public housing is 50%. And so we started doing mixed income housing, which is definitely the best way to, to go. And so th that really helped it. The tax exemption was really only two or 3% and didn't make that much difference, but the, but the projects were uh, uh, property tax exempt. So when you combine the interest rate reduction and the property tax, you had a, a, a decent subsidy. So uh, we built quite a few things. I, I thought I'd tell you about you know, some other, you'd asked me about policies before. Uh, the first large apartment building I built, uh, I was startled to go see it one day when they were just getting the foundations going and everybody stopped. 
And I said, what's going on? And they said, well, the Office of Thrift Supervision has passed the loans to one lender rule. And, and your, uh, your, your builder has too many loans with these lenders. And so they've cut him off. So I, I had to go find somebody else to finish the project. It was very scary. It could have ended my career. But I found somebody, and after that, the windfall was that other builders could not build on their properties. And so I was able to use tax exempt bonds to build projects from one end of the county to the other. And that also fed our home ownership programs. We would get, get people from our new multifamily projects and help them with down payment assistance to get into home ownership opportunities. So it's strange sometimes how you can almost fail for, from a policy and then take advantage of it. Now, why don't other agencies do more tax-exempt financing? Is it because they're not also an HFA? Well, that could be. Now, when I started, no one had been doing it. I, I actually waited for like four years for the interest rate to come down to 8%. That's what it took to make things work. So for a long time, uh, the interest rates were too high and people forgot how to do it. So uh, we would have meetings in our state and in the regional uh, NARO and other groups and, and tell people how to do this. And it became a big deal. And we ha had did three surveys, two with the University of Washington and one with Harvard on what's called essential function bonds, governmental purpose bonds. So the bonds we would sell would not be for a private person, but for the housing authority or the housing finance agency, or we could do nonprofit bonds. And uh, it became you know, so fantastic that uh, it, we were able to do these studies and found that Washington did more than any place in the rest of the United States. And then it really started taking on after they read the Harvard study because people found out how to enhance the bonds. They would get counties or cities to guarantee them. And then I actually had a meeting with Standard & Poor's and they created a rating system for housing authorities so that if you were large enough and had enough cash in your, you know, uh, in, in the bank to, to be a, a, a good resource, and reserves, then you could be rated. I think Vancouver Housing Authority was one of the first to be rated in our state. And so uh, there were lots of other bells and whistles that we uh, were able to add with different types of, uh, of uh, financing. And, and actually, I, I, I don't think I mentioned that we were, I worked for uh, about six years for the creation of the Washington State Housing Finance Commission. Uh, and it was, you know, a time when interest rates were so high that people could, you know, there were 18% in 1982 and 83. And so uh, it, finally the mortgage bankers and the home builders relented and we were able to, you know, have the finance agency uh, sell some bonds and they sell mostly single family bonds for mortgages. You know, and we were never able to compete with them because the way they wrote the law, they had an advantage in the income so that they could serve. So we did a lot of essential function bonds. And I actually had sort of a run-in with the agency that I helped create when I went to my bond council and said, well, I have a new idea. We'll use essential function bonds and build single family homes and then turn them over to new homeowners when they can get up a down payment. And Larry Carter, who was our bond council at Preston Gates said, oh, you can't do that. But it turns out he was the bond council for the finance agency. So when I went to Hugh Spitzer at Foster Pepper, he said, that's a great idea. And so we would build duplexes and triplexes. And after a certain number of years, we would be able to pay off the bonds in pieces and sell the units to the, to the tenants who had been living there for several years, building up their credit. And we actually did a huge uh, 120 unit condominium that had been closed down in 1982 because they couldn't sell them out because of the interest rates being so high and so those individually. So it became a, a very you know, big program in our state. I don't think a lot of people realize how creative and how finance oriented the executive directors or the CEOs of housing authorities have to be today, mostly because we haven't had any new construction programs other than tax credit for a long, long time, since basically the early 80s. And you've had really tackle a lot of challenges in order to do this. So think back and maybe tell us about some of the toughest ones that you've taken on. 
Well, I, I think that the toughest financing was actually the, the Norm Dix Government Center, because you can do more than housing with essential function bonds. You can do offices for the, that are public. And uh, it was part of our redevelopment of the, uh, of the city of Bremerton. And none of the small towns or uh, small government agencies could afford new offices. And the city of Bremerton's, you know, city hall was just decrepit and molded and terrible. And so I was able to realize that they had excise taxes that could only be used for capital construction. And they had actually saved some of that up because they didn't know how to use it. And so we created the first government condominium that we've ever been able to find anywhere in the United States. And we had the Kitsap Housing Authority in there and the Bremerton Housing Authority. It was Bremerton City Hall. We had the County Community Development Block Grant Agency. We had Cooperative Extension and several other smaller governmental agencies. And it was a six-story building, 100,000 square feet. And we won an award uh, from NIOP, which is the National Association of Industrial and, uh, and other properties. And we beat out Paul Allen, who built a, a, a Tommy Bahama uh, office building and, and with marble and other things in it because it was such a creative financing. And, and uh, I think that was the most difficult because I had to get all those people to sign leases for their floors that they would own when they finished paying them off. And uh, it was a great success and a beautiful building. And, but that was, you know, you can imagine how hard it is talking cities and counties that don't normally get along and health departments and all those other people into agreeing to be in one building and having an association. And we told them, we'll have all these spaces that you can use that cooperatively, the city hall meeting area, the, all this. And it actually worked out the way we thought it would. It was amazing. Do you feel that was an example of maybe the partnership between the public and private sector? No, that there was there was actually there was no federal money in it, and there were no and there and the only only the cafe was the only uh, private part. It was all a housing authority revitalization bond, and we we actually didn't have to change any laws to do that. Although we did change some laws later for the rest of the revitalization. But public and private partnerships are, are essential these days. The, you know, the government just doesn't have enough money. They need to entice partners, people with more experience. And you were right. In the past, when I started, very few housing authorities had any development experience at all. They were all caretakers of public housing doing what Mother Mayhide <laughs> told them to do. And so uh, now we're getting a new group of people who are having being forced to do this because of rad because if they don't you know do something with their public housing it's just going to fall apart now some people have said a little bit about rad but i would like you to talk about it from the practitioner's point of view well i actually never actually did a, a, a rad project because we had so little public housing i was constantly building new but i was using the same tools the low-income housing tax credit and and also uh, these housing authorities had learned how to use bonds. And so if you can use the 4% tax credit with tax exempt bonds, you usually don't have to wait in line. There's tremendous competition for the 9% credit, which funds used to fund most of everything. But uh, pretty soon the competition was too stiff, but there's really uh, not much competition for the four if you have bond cap from the state. And so uh, that was one of the things that we kind of led our group into by doing the bonds was housing to use the low income housing. And we had to change the state law so that housing authorities could do low income housing tax credits. And I did one of the first ones and we didn't structure it properly. We didn't have the housing authority continue to own the land underneath. So it turns out they wanted us to pay property taxes. And it took me three years to change the law in the state. And we did it by saying anyone who uses state housing trust fund money and into their projects is exempt. And then I became paying exempt, but it was a painful uh, three years and a difficult time, but everybody benefited from it. One of those sleepless nights types of experiences, right? Yes, exactly. Like the time you go in and they tell you, oh, I'm sorry, there's an insurance crisis. You have no insurance anymore. And I went to the county and the county was able to put us on their insurance until our housing authorities created their own agency, which is actually even in California now, I think. So we created a, an insurance company and, and uh, avoided that you know, problem in the future. That's that creativity and trailblazer stuff that I was talking about that you've done. 
I looked at your company and your company really has had a variety of assignments, case studies, uh, research, work plans, goals, budgets, to doing things like assisting people with applications and designing strategies. So what do you like best about these projects and being in business for yourself? Well, I like meeting new people and the challenges of the new projects. And the, some of the applications are extremely revealing. You know, when we work with Standard & Poor's to create their uh, rating for agencies, they would just put you through the ringer. That you'd have a four or five inch books of answers to all their questions about your finances and your management and everything like that. Well, if you applied for New Markets tax credits, it would be even more uh, revealing. And so just doing an application would show the weaknesses uh, in different agencies so that they could make plans to fortify their accounting department or broaden some other management uh, uh, deficiency that they had. So uh, it was always a revealing situation. And, uh, you know, I just liked the people so much. Of all the experiences that you have had in public sector, private sector, state, federal, all over the place, which experience would you say was the most rewarding to you? Well, I, I think it was being the president of NALFA, the National Association of Local Housing Finance Agencies. And you had a lot of national, national talent on your, in your groups. And, and uh, there's a, a lot of you know, uh, local things that happen that are really important as well. And NALFA was created when the uh, National Association of Counties fell apart. The, the NALFA was the entitlement cities, and they said the National Association of County and Community Economic Development were the entitlement counties. And uh, I was really, you know, amazed the first time I went to a meeting in San Francisco and I met the heads of the Bank of America and all these other places, and not many people would even talk to me, you know, but, but over time they became my best friends and I thought, my goodness, I'm here with Atlanta, New York, Miami, you know, all of the, San Francisco, all the biggest, well, New York is the biggest in the country, you know, selling billions and billions of bonds and stuff like that. But they decided that I should be the president for three years. And it was just extremely rewarding. And, and, that, and that's where I've gotten a lot of my ideas and, and some of my very best friends and, and a lot of the people who've hired me after I left the housing authority. You'll get a kick out of this, but yesterday I interviewed Joe Schuldiner. Yes, I know Joe. Thinking of New York mm -hmm. and LA. <laughs> yes. So what do you really feel is your legacy in both the public housing and the general communities area? Well, I have an eternal flame in Bremerton that the uh, Puget Sound Energy gave me. They went around to the major counties around Seattle and asked the community to vote on who was the most important leader in their community. And I was the only one in, uh, of any of the communities that had 100% a, a of the vote. And I was shocked. And so I have an eternal flame on the Bremerton waterfront in front of some condominiums that I built. Uh, and anybody coming in or out of the ferry from Seattle to Bremerton can, can see it. And I go by and see it. And it's, it's a, a wonderful tribute for all the housing that we built and the education programs we did for children. And, it was, uh, you know, it was a wonderful thing. So I have thousands of, 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 of units all across the country because we did more than just build uh, units. We were uh, in the mark to market program. We actually worked in eight states doing, you know, restructuring the loans of federally insured apartments. And uh, it was uh, quite an experience. And, and uh, you know, my board was very, very, uh, uh, willing to let us do things that hadn't been done before. We, we operated home ownership programs in four counties and then to work out of the state, it was a, a magnificent opportunity. Most people don't know how important that is to have a supportive board. Oh, it's key, it's key. And of course mine were winning and losing elections coming on and off all the time. And so, you know, it was, it was, it was a very, you know, it was, and it helps, I think, there was a lot of fight in the beginning about our authority because they thought, well, it's better if you don't have politicians on your board, you know, you'll be too politicized, but actually they're the ones that make the decisions. So it was great for us. Hmm. Tell us a little bit more about your experience in Bremerton with the Community Revitalization Agency. 
Well, that was a wonderful time too, and, and, and another complicated situation. The, the city asked us to help. At the time, you know, the county uh, uh, was, in the early 70s, they were developing the Trident submarine base on, the, on, on Bangor. And the government went to the city of Brampton and said, we're gonna give you millions of dollars to beef up all of your infrastructure, fire and schools, to, you know, accommodate this submarine base. And the city said, no, we don't want it. And so the county commissioners actually created a new city that was unincorporated in the middle of the county called Silverdale and built highways to it to service the, the Bangor base. And when they built Silverdale, everybody left Bremerton. And when I was there, you know, in, in starting the redevelopment part, you couldn't buy socks or toothpaste or anything downtown. All the major stores were gone, Nordstrom's, Macy's, Penny's, they all went to the mall in Silverdale. And you'd get off the ferry and just walk through empty streets, and it was really depressing. And we still had many of the brick buildings that were there from the First World War. They were all empty and falling apart. And so <clears throat> we went in, and, and uh, we, it, it really took several years of community meetings. We hired Peter Calthorpe, who is a, you know, a major architect, regional city planner. And he came in, and, and we uh, you know, actually redesigned the downtown area. So we had to change the comprehensive plan for the city, as well as creating a plan that would allow us to be a redevelopment agency. And we looked at the urban, urban redevelopment law in the state and said, well, this doesn't work. And so we had to go down to the legislature and we created the Community Revitalization Act. And, and our agency was appointed the first community revitalization agency in the state. And that let us, allowed us to sell the bonds for the Norm Dix building and for condominiums and office buildings and, and other things in the redevelopment of the city. And we did about $300 million worth of redevelopment in the city. And it's stunning. We did the whole waterfront and we built parks and you know office buildings and it got us into the new markets tax credit program. And, and so uh, it was a, a wonderful transformation. So the new markets tax credit program, tell us a little bit about that. Well, that's something, you know, I, I hope we're going to talk about self-help homeownership sometime in the rural area. And I was on, the, I'm on the board of the National Rural Housing Coalition. And Bob Raposa is in charge of that group. And he started uh, probably in 1976 or something like that in an effort to create the New Markets Tax Credit Program, which is uh, a, a, a tax credit that's used for commercial development in specific areas designated by the Treasury Department. So it's a place-based subsidy. And we applied for it in the, in the uh, first year and received $40 million. And we did redevelopment you know, in downtown office buildings, hotels. We did a, a hospital in Anacortes, Washington. We did part of the Pike Place Market social service area. And then uh, again in 2007, we got another $20 million. It's, it's a little comp too complicated to explain quickly here, but it's a, it's a tremendous place-based subsidy. And working with the Treasury was just fantastic because these people are so smart and uh, they still continue to do a great job. So let's talk a little bit about the self-help program. Tell us about that. Well, I think it's the best program that the federal government has because it allows families, usually 10 or 12 at a time, to build their own homes with supervision. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has a mortgage program, which uh, the interest rate can be subsidized down to 1%. And I think it can go up to 28 years. And it has a, something called the 523 Technical Assistance Grant, which pays the money for us to bring the families together Get, the, get them qualified for a mortgage and then take them through the entire construction process. And no one moves into their house until the last house is finished. And they all get to know each other. They all take care of their kids. And so it builds community and it builds people's you know, uh, character and strength knowing that you know, they've been able to do such an incredible thing and they usually don't default or move because they love their houses so much. So I, yeah. The old barn raising type of Yes, yes. And we, we did other uh, rural programs with the uh, what's called the 515 
uh, multifamily program. I actually did, you know, one of, the, one of the last ones before they they stopped lending for that. And then we would we would buy them. And it's very very difficult to purchase an existing uh, multifamily apartment owned by USDA because they have so many multiple multiple layers of rules that they can't figure it out themselves. And so it's shocking. You have on one hand the self help ownership program, which you would think would be enormously you know, difficult because you have construction going and we always wanted to start one program right after another. The USDA does a tremendous job of, of funding and inspecting and, and doing everything on like that. But then on the multifamily end, we have, you know, 400,000 units that are languishing because the rents are too low and they can't afford to keep them up and they, and, and they don't understand the rules enough to allow them to be purchased by nonprofits or for profits. So, uh, you know, one agency has a, a lot of different programs and some are, are knocking down the ballpark and some are kind of dragging it down. Were there income limits in the self-help program? Oh yes, absolutely. We, I think we had to have, well, we had to have some below 50% and you know, the majority below 80%. And, and uh, you might be able to one or two for the other and they don't have the income averaging factor. So it's difficult to hit those marks. And so after a while, we had to add block grant money and other second subsidies on there to, to make that work as time went on. And I've got to tell you one other story, and that is that it can only be done in their designated rural areas. And so USDA would come out every year and drive around the county and say, well, look, there's some building over there. This must be urban. And then they would shrink your rural area so you would have less and less land that you could build on. And in our state, we have statewide land use planning, which constricted all the development into the urban areas. And so you didn't have the zoning you needed to build in the rural areas. And so I had to go to uh, Congressman Dix, and then we went to Rosa Deloria from Connecticut and said, oh my goodness, this is terrible. You know, we can't do our program anymore. We're doing it in Mason County and Clallam County and, and Jefferson County, but we can't do it in our county because they've shrunk the boundaries. And so they changed the boundaries to every part of the county outside of the city of Bremerton. And, uh, every, and then in years after that, we were able to continue that to be grandfathered. And so now we still have the largest self-help homeownership program in the Northwest. That's amazing. Before we go global, is, are there any other stories that you have for us? Then we'll talk about some global stuff. Well, one thing, well, there's two things I wanted to bring up. That <clears throat> One of them is what I'm working on now. I'm on the board of, of a group called the Mustard Seed Project. It's rural. It's, it, it's in, a, in a new markets tax credit eligible area, highly distressed. And it's, uh, we have no senior housing. I live on a long peninsula called the Key Peninsula across from Tacoma. And uh, the, uh, I got involved with this because of a friend and they're trying to build a 30 unit assisted living project in Key Center, which just has a, just a few stores. And, and they, this group has been providing transportation and meal service and home repair for the seniors in the area, taking care of them. And because mo most of the people would like to stay in their homes, that's our major effort is to keep people in their homes. But when they can't, they have to move away and they're too far from their support system, from their families and others. So we've been working to develop that with something called the greenhouse model that came out of Ala Alabama and Atnu Gwande, who, who I don't know if you heard of him, he's a famous physician, you know, and right now, because of the pandemic, this is the model. It's smaller. You can walk around the outside and see people inside and the way it's designed and the way that people are taken care of is going to be what's going to happen from now on because of the pandemic. Two people in a room is not going to make it. Several levels is not going to be as desirable, but it's very, very difficult to build something so small because we don't have the, the economy of scale. And so we're, we devised a, a unique financing using the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Community Facilities Loan Program because they consider this assisted living is not necessarily housing, but an institutional situation. We do have to be licensed by the state. And uh, so we're using that with private uh, financing and and we probably might have been able to use new markets tax credits but it's 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 the future i think we really need to look out for our seniors now because of the pandemic that's a message i wanted to get across and any other kind of new model it's going to keep them safe the other thing i want to briefly mention is is the fact that 
we have a, 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 a several giants in our state. We have the richest people in the world. And Amazon, it, Jeff Bezos is one of them. And he, he, I'm not gonna say he has ruined downtown, because it's not his fault, but he decided to take over an area south of Lake Union when the, you know, uh, Paul Allen had bought a tremendous acreage to create something like Central Park. And he put it up to a vote of the people of the city of Seattle, did they want a park? And they said, no. And so Amazon decided that's where they wanted to build up their headquarters. And because they brought in so many people making $125,000, $150,000 a year, and they didn't have any plans for where they should live, they bought every place that you know all the low-income people lived, and they're all out on the street. And it's a terrible mess. You know, the, the homeless problem was, was bad before that, and it just got worse. And so now, he, you know, he's probably going to be, he's going to be moving 25,000 people in the next couple of years to Bellevue across the water. So it's close, but it's not downtown because they passed a head tax. But the point of this is that there are UNESCO World Heritage Villages, and I went to one called Saltaire, where my grandfather lived. And it was after the mill owners had, divide, had built several mills and they knew the things that they were doing wrong. And he did everything right. He built housing for the people who live there. He built hospitals, pension homes, schools, beautiful parks. And, uh, and if we had had better planning, or if Amazon had anticipated what this growth would do to the community, they, they would have provided for more earlier and provided more for the displaced people. Because it's, right now, it's going to take years for them to dig out. Is it possible to get Amazon as one of your partners, in a sense, to create something much better for the lower income people? Well, they're working on it. They've, they've you know, worked with the homeless shelter, Mary's Place, and they've, you know, dedicated some of their money. Uh, uh, Bezos has not really started giving away much of his money until the past couple of years. And so we need to get him in that habit. I mean, he's just gone from 100 billion to 200 billion to richest person, the first person over 200 billion. And, so, and I know that the state is probably going to try and get some of his money and his, his wife is the richest woman. And then we have, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates, who've done really well. And and, and we have the Allens and, you know, we have some of the richest people in the world right here, but they haven't been contributing as much. And, and people were, you know, for a while with philanthropists were disappointed because the Hershey's didn't, you know, invest in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and Bill Gates was doing things across the world. Of course, now with the pandemic, we're kind of glad he learned about dealing with malaria and all these and polio and all these other things. But, you know, some of the money from home needs to stay home. And the people who are, you know, building giant corporations need better planning and the cities need to anticipate that as well. So, and I think maybe, you know, we will hopefully we'll learn in the future about this, but the pandemic may also spread everything out. We may have more people working in suburbia. I know the air is a lot cleaner and the, the roads are not as crowded. So uh, the pandemic may have a, a, a positive side as well. Let's go kind of global and ask you, what do you feel is the biggest challenge in housing and communities that we're facing today? Well, uh, we don't have enough. We need to build more as fast as we can of all, of all types, but certainly for the lower income. And, and you had asked, uh, you know, before intimated, you know, what's the biggest challenge and it's inequality. It's inequity, it's, people, it's, it's income equality. And, uh, and uh, I mentioned before we started a book called Capitalism in the 21st Century by Pinkety. And he did a study over time that shows, uh, you know, how this has happened over and over again. And, and we just have too much wealth concentrated in too few hands. And it doesn't, you know, do the community and the country, you know, that uh, justice to have this type of uh, investment not helping the community as much as it should. So what do you think is the future of affordable housing? Well, I think it's tremendous business to get in because we've got so much need, so much tremendous demand. And we need young people to get in and find new ways to accomplish, you know, the mission of creating more. And I think the, the, in the housing area, supportive housing is the most difficult because it's one thing to build a place that people can afford the rent. It's another that brings the services that you need for the people who have mental health problems or whatever problem that they have where they need some sort of uh, support.
Do, so do you view income inequality as the biggest problem for society, kind of now and in the future, the near future? Yes, absolutely. That's correct. Now, during COVID, we've all certainly had lessons. What have you learned is the most important thing in your life? Oh, my, my family, my wife and my daughter and my two granddaughters and my son and, uh, and, and my two dogs. <laughs> it's, peop it's people that are most important and creating memories with them by doing good things with them that's what makes people happy it's not things that make people happy you know at, at purpose in life i think is second and i've always had purpose and so you know those two combined are the most important things do you think a lot of people are starting to realize how much time they've been spending at work and not with their family yes and commuting Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. They've learned a lot more. And of course, they're all fixing up their houses now. You can't get anybody to come do any work. <laughs> what do you think is the future of remote workers? Oh, tremendous. Absolutely. It's people are learning how to Zoom and, and do all these things. And they, and they realize they didn't necessarily need to go in all the time. And I've you know, worked all across the country and I do a lot of it from home. And I think it's really important that we max this out, that we are able to take the technology as far as we can so that we you know, have cleaner skies and, and less crowded roads and people have more time to be at home. So the next question that would follow is, what do you think about the investing in office buildings when people are going to go more remote workers? What will be the future of office buildings? Well, it's really shocking because I don't think they're going to be able to get as many people in them, even when they go back. And so how are they going to afford it? I think this is going to be, you know, one of the biggest crunches besides malls disappearing and becoming, you know, fulfillment centers for Amazon. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, really, really going to be uh, very difficult. And maybe it will be better if Amazon shifted people through the offices so you wouldn't have as many people downtown at the same time. But no, we're, I think we're going to see some major defaults in the office building sector. It seems like we might. With the current environment, what do you dream of for the future? I dream of a Democratic president, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic House. You asked. <laughs> That's what I dream about. So, you know, you asked me about the future. In November, is going to determine the future. And, and uh, I've just got my fingers crossed. So thinking about the younger generation, maybe those in about their 20s, what advice do you have for them? Well, you know, just the things that I, I, I did was is you, you got to have a good education. You have to figure out what kind of people you like to work with. And hopefully you will figure out something that will help other people so that you are doing something for society and not just for yourself. And, uh, you know, Roosevelt had a saying, and I just wish I could remember all of it, but you need to take risks. You need to be brave. You know, you, you, you need to take chances. You need to, you need to uh, uh, extend yourself. That's good advice. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, I think we've been over almost everything. I, I uh, you know, I just know that if the money's not there, you need to find some place to make it. And, and that's usually, you know, through your state legislature, your county, your city, or, you know, or GoFundMe, you know, you need to constantly be on the lookout because that's what, it, that's what you need to make change. And that's certainly what you need to make housing. So, and I've really enjoyed it. We've created so many different funding uh, opportunities that uh, have made such a big difference. It's, 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 an, it's enriching. Well, you've had so much to offer in this area, both in housing and in economic development and the creation of cities. I'm just thinking that it, without your creativity and without your willing to take that risk you just talked about, I don't know that we would be certainly in that area of the country. It would be where it is today without what you have done. So I really thank you for everything you've done in this area. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm you know, very honored to be a fellow and, 
and uh, have always admired you and everything you've done and Kent. So thanks again. It was great talking to you.